we know there are multiple factors that um, that affect human performance. There's the player's innate cognitive and physical abilities. There's diet, hydration, training. There's mental preparation, experience, coaching. And I'm going to show you how sleep and your circadian rhythms actually affect each and every aspect of each and every factor that influences performance. So to that end, I have divided this talk into four parts. I'm going to start out by talking about why sleep is important for athletes. Then I'm going to talk about how much sleep athletes need to perform to do peak performance to, uh, to win. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the science that drives alertness and performance before I summarize. And I, th I, I have a few slides. I want to talk a little bit about teen sleep because that's relevant to the parents in the audience. Okay, so why is sleep important to the athlete? So you've probably heard sleep scientists say that although we spend a third of our life sleeping, we really don't know, we still don't know what the exact function of sleep is. We, we know that, we know what happens if you don't get enough sleep. And that has profound implications for athletes. So the first reason athletes need enough sleep is because of, for their, you know, for their optimum reaction time and for accuracy. So if you get eight hours in bed, your reaction time is normal, which is about a quarter of a second, right? If instead of getting eight hours, you get six hours in bed, that triples, which, and that may not make a difference to you and I, or to me when I'm giving a talk here, but can make all the difference between when you're playing in any sort of sports. In professional sports, wins are right now, they're measured in milli inches and milli uh, and milliseconds. So milliseconds are important. But what I want to draw your attention to is not just what happens if you get one night of less sleep, but what happens when you get less sleep on a regular basis. These deficits, they accumulate. So this is a study, this is a copy, and I'm going to make it really simple. What they're looking, these are sleep deprivation studies in which people are getting three hours in bed for seven days versus five hours versus seven hours versus nine hours in bed for a period of uh, seven days. And then following each experiment, the, everybody is given, yes, everybody is given, thank you, is given three days of nine hours in bed. And so you can see that your mean speed on performance tasks is reduced. So it's reduced if you get three hours versus five hours versus seven versus nine. But as time goes by, it keeps getting worse. So those deficits, they accumulate. And then in the end, when everybody is getting nine hours in bed, there is recovery, but there's, it's never as good as somebody who's getting nine hours in bed, you know, who's been getting it on a regular basis. Similarly, the number of lapses, the number of times you miss cues in the environment, the, it increases, it, it's worse, but it keeps getting worse. And there is some recovery, but never somebody, never as good as somebody who's getting nine hours in bed. And this is important. You know, what I want to draw your attention to is somebody who's getting seven hours in bed, which we think is pretty darn fine, right? Somebody who's getting seven hours in bed, still not as good as somebody who's getting nine hours in bed when it comes to your reaction time and accuracy. Okay, the second reason you need enough sleep is because you need sleep to play the intelligent game. You know, when you wake up and you get less sleep and you, you, you feel sort of groggy and you sort of feel hungover, there, we now know that there are some parts of the brain that actually get less blood supply when you're sleep deprived. And that's your prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that's responsible for good judgment. It's responsible for multitasking, making the right decision. That is preferentially deprived of blood supply when you're sleep deprived. And in contrast, there's actually one part of the brain that lights up when you get less blood, blood supply, and that's your emotional brain. So when you're sleep deprived and you're making decisions, you're doing it with a brain that is overly emotional, while, while your, the good judgment part of your brain is not working as much. You know, I don't know if you've heard, but all the memory that is consolidated all memory, memory consolidation occurs only while you're sleeping. So whatever you learn during the day, whether it's you know, motor skills when you're learning, when you're playing hockey, or it's, you know, it's procedural memory. So if you're learning something, um, you know, um, rote memorization, if you're learning a fact, your brain hits that save button while you're sleeping. It only occurs while you're sleeping. So sleep is really essential for memory too.
So you really need it. If, you wanna, if your players need to learn whatever strategies coaches have taught them, they need to sleep after that so that that strategy becomes part of that memory. The third thing, of course, is that you need, we, now, we know that you need sleep for emotional regulation. So inter as well as intrapersonal re uh, emotional <coughs> regulation. You know, the ability to see something and then, you know, take a minute before you react. Sleep deprivation is, uh, has a profound effect on each and every aspect of that emotional regulation. So right, you know, just before the um, NBA playoffs started, because I, I, I consult with a bunch of, um, with a, a lot of professional teams in all the major leagues. I had, a, I had this um, NBA coach call me and he realized that whenever he was sleep deprived, he would completely lose it uh, as a referee when he was on, on screen. And this was something that he was, you know, he'd been, he had been coached on. So he, it, would, it would always be the last three, four minutes in the game. And it didn't really matter what the referee was saying. He would completely lose it. He'd lose his cool. He'd be, you know, on national TV, spitting, you know, and yelling. And his kids would call him and say, we can, you know, we can hear what you're saying, Dad. And he wasn't able to control it. And the one thing he realized is that if he got less sleep than the day before, whatever, however he'd been coached to not respond, he wasn't able to do it. Right? Because he had been coached, he was practicing to be in the situation and not respond. So it's really important for emotional regulation. Also, we now know that le less sleep means you're, there's a higher likelihood of you being injured. So this study was done in high school athletes and they were followed for about 22 months and they found that the number of hours of sleep had the most profound effect on the likelihood of getting injured if you slept less than eight hours, the likelihood of getting injured increased by 1.7 times, which sort of makes sense because if your reaction time is, is off, if you're not as accurate, and if you're making poor decisions, you're more likely to get injured, right? And, the, but, and, and also we now know, so the effects of sleep deprivation on postural control have been studied. And in fact, sleep deprivation preferentially affects those small muscle, uh, balance muscles which are in your feet. And in, in hockey, feet, your feet are everything, right? You get injured. If you can't move your feet and place them correctly, you really can't play. So, um, but, and once you're injured, you need sleep for muscle restoration. So um, testosterone, which is secreted, it, it, you know, it's under circadian control, but it's profoundly affected by the number of hours of sleep you get. So in a, in the, in a study, they looked at young adults and for a week, instead of getting their eight hours in bed, they were given five hours in bed on a regular basis. And it reduced the testosterone levels as if they had aged by 11 years. So for a 20 year old player, that's having testosterone levels of somebody who's 31. And nobody wants that, right? Testosterone is really important for muscle health, for vigor, um, but it's also, it also gives you that little amount of aggression that you need when you're on the ice. So the other thing is that growth hormone is only secreted during your deep sleep. So when you're sleep deprived, all the hormones that break down muscle increase, while the hormones that build muscle actually reduce. Inflammation increases if you're sleep deprived. So I, I work with Major League Baseball players, and so pitchers, after they're done, icing their arm is really important, but it's also important to sleep after that. Because if you ice your arm, and you get on a plane, and you get three hours of sleep, that inflammation is not going to get better. You know, you're still going, those inflammatory factors are going to remain high. Immunity needs sleep. So, you know, there is a study that looks at the effect of the flu vaccine. So if you, if you give somebody flu vaccine and don't allow them to sleep, they don't build uh, the factors that are responsible for giving you the immunity from developing the flu. So um, the other thing is that you need enough sleep because sleep loss makes you feel pain more. So just by getting, being sleep deprived, your perception of pain increases, which is a bad thing because when you feel that you're still in pain, you don't feel like you're recovering and you're more likely to seek medication and drugs that can, again, impair performance the next day. And finally, of course, we know that sleep deprivation, just by being sleep deprived, it can impair glucose metabolism. So these are studies done in young, again, young, 
healthy adults. These are not athletes, these are just young college students out of the University of Chicago. And these are sleep deprivation studies and they sleep deprive them for a period of six or seven days and then they give them recovery sleep. And the, at the end of the six or seven day period, they find that they no longer utilize their, metabolize their glucose efficiently. So they're, they're pre-diabetic. So this is just what happens when you're sleep deprived, right? So which, which sort of makes sense because when you're asleep, you're fasting. And that's because your brain secretes a hormone called leptin, which allows you to fast. And, if you, and when you're awake, your stomach secretes a hormone, it's called ghrelin, and it makes you hungry. Now what's happened in the last few years is that people are getting less and less sleep. So, you know, when we were hunters and gatherers, and if we didn't get enough sleep, that meant you were in danger. Your body knew it had to conserve energy. It needed to store fat. It wanted to make you hungry so you'd eat. But you know, right now, if you don't sleep, the only hunting you do is when you get up and go to the refrigerator. <laughs> so people tend to eat, you know, they tend to eat more. And experiments show that when you're sleep deprived and you are hungrier, you're, you're craving carbohydrate rich fatty foods. It's not fruits and vegetables that people are eating in the middle of the night when they're sleep deprived. Okay, and of course, you know, this is, these are uh, sleep deprivation studies done out of UCSF. Um, they look at elite uh, athletes, elite cyclists, and they found that sleep deprivation um, decreased their metabolism by 4%. And it also, also, they looked at, these were endurance athletes, and they found that it decreased the time to exhaustion. So on maximal effort, they got tired faster. And by sleep extension, they, it, you know, they were able to do maximal effort for a longer time. And, you know, does this have actual implications? Well, there was a study. It looked at late night tweeting in the NBA. So they started out and they looked over five seasons. These are actual NBA real athletes, their, their tweets. And late night tweeting was defined as tweeting between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning. And then they, and they, they looked at only East Coast versus East Coast players because they didn't want to, you know, influence of jet lag and travel in it. And they found that late night, the, the athletes who, who were tweeting at night, they had, there was significant less, they were um, points scored per, the ga per game. And there was a significant less, significantly less field goal shooting percentage, significantly less free throw shooting percentage. So it does have real life implications, not getting enough sleep. But in my opinion, this is the best way. This study is the best way for you to understand what the effects of sleep deprivation are. So these, this is a study done out of Henry Ford lab. And what we do is we, um, we compare the effect of impairment from sleep deprivation and compare it to the effect of drinking beer. So if instead of getting eight hours in bed, you're getting six hours, that's equivalent to drinking two to three beers on these performance tasks. If you're, drink, you're getting four hours of sleep, that's equivalent to drinking five to six beers with, you know, well above the legal limit. So I have a question for you. How many of you show up to work in the morning or show up to the hockey rink after drinking two to three beers? Raise your hands. <laughs> now, how many of you have come shown up to work or to the hockey rink after getting less, less than eight hours of sleep? You all have done that, right? You do that because this is the culture we live in. We, this, we believe that we can get by with less sleep. We, and I'm here to tell you that you really can't. See, the problem is that there are two reasons why we're, we, we do that. The first reason we do that is that when you get l less sleep and you do this on a chronic basis, you no longer, that becomes your new normal. So here, let me, let me tell you, let me give you an example. So if last night you didn't sleep at all, you'd be sleepy tomorrow, the next day, right? But if instead of that, if over the next four days, instead of getting eight hours, you got like five hours in bed, by the end of like seven days, you won't feel sleepy. Although you'd be impaired. Because what happens is we add up to the sense of sleepiness. This becomes our new normal and people do this for months and years. And because this becomes your new normal, people don't take countermeasures, right? And this, which is why driving is a very dangerous situation. I want to talk to you about driving. I'll do that later um, when it comes to teenagers. 
why drowsy driving is so dangerous. But, but also, this, the second part is that this is part of our culture, right? We have been told so often about the bad effects of drunk driving or, you know, alcohol, that nobody's going to confess that they've ever shown up to work after, or shown up to the hockey rink after drinking. Because we know it's a bad thing. But we all wear this as a badge of honor that we can get by with less sleep, and so we talk about it all the time, right? Okay. So, so how much sleep do we need to win? So when we talk about sleep need, how much sleep do adults need to function normally? Not, not playing, but just to function normally. Well, you know, you, you might have heard the word seven to nine hours, and, and at really that, that uh, originated in this study, this was done in, 90, in 93, and what they did is they, they, had, they asked people how much sleep they were getting, and this is part of a large study, and most people were, get, on, the, on an average, people were getting about six to seven hours of sleep. So for the first one week, they had people sleeping for six to seven hours. But then for the next four weeks, they gave them 14, 14 hours of, of uh, bedtime then for the next 14 weeks, uh, for the next four weeks, 14 hours. And what they found is in the first one or two weeks, people actually consumed 10 to 14 hours of sleep because they were playing catch up. But then at the end of those four weeks, the, the asymptote was, so they were, you know, they, the average was about eight hours. So, you know, that's the way to find out how much sleep you need, is by taking a, a long vacation where you can sleep as much as possible. Because in the, in the beginning, you're going to be playing catch up, because you're going to make up for sleep debt. And then the amount of sleep you get, that's the amount of sleep you need. On an average, people, adults need between seven to nine hours of sleep to function well. Now, there is a genetic, um, <clears throat> there is a, um, you can't call it a disease, but there is a genetic variation in which there are some people who need about four hours of sleep to function well. None of you have it. <laughs> Just FYI. I don't care what you say, you don't. Like the, the, you know, if you take 100 people and you round it up, the percentage is less than, less than zero because it's 0.003% zero, zero, 0 you know, of the population have it. The likelihood that you guys have it is very, very low. The likelihood that you're sleep depriving yourself is much higher and more likely. Okay, so, so that's what we say that you need about, you know, adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep. But how much sleep do you need for optimal performance? That's about nine to 10 hours. That's what athletes need. And you know, this is based out of studies. Th these were done on Stanford student athletes. And for a period of six weeks, they made sure that they spend 10 hours in bed, right? And um, they, had, they would monitor them, make sure they spend 10 hours in bed. If they were spending 10 hours in bed, they were getting about between eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep. And um, they started out with the, uh, the men's basketball team and they, at the end of those uh, six weeks, they found there was a 9% increase, in increase in free throws and three point field goals. So there was a significant improvement in their play. They were also sprinting faster. There's a 0.7 second sprint, faster sprint. And you know, this may seem small to you, 0.7, but if you look at the Olympics, if you look at well, the NHL, NHL games, 0.7 can make a big difference to whether you're going to win or lose a game. Also, um, when they were outside, um, when they were not on the court, they, they, were, they were less sleepy, they had, uh, you know, they had less fatigue, less tension, less depression. So, you know, players were happier. Um, they, they then did this in Stanford football athletes and they found that they shaved off 0.12 seconds faster off the 40 yard dash. If you guys follow the NFL, the 40 yard dash is what they do at the NFL combine, right? And if you shave off 0.12 seconds faster, I think for this year, if you shaved off 0.12 faster from the guy who was number one, he would drop to number like 46. That's the difference. That's how much difference it makes. Then they showed it in tennis players. They've done it in a bunch of, um, um, a bunch of other sports. So, so, so when we say how much sleep do athletes need for peak performance, for professional athletes, about, it's about nine to 10 hours. For teenagers, it's about nine hours. That's the amount of sleep teenagers need to function normally. Okay. So, 
So now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little about the science, what drives alertness and performance with, um, during a 24 hour period. So the first is, so there are two, there are two independent things processes that decide how sleepy or alert you are in a 24 hour period. The first is your sleep load, which is basically the number of hours you've been awake, right? So if you wake up at six o'clock, by that time 10 or 11 o'clock rolls around, you have 16 or 17 hours of wakefulness that has accumulated. This is your sleep load. And then when you fall asleep, you consume that, right? And then, but in addition to this, all of us, also have a clock in our brain, right? And that's your biological clock. So when you wake up in the morning, that clock secretes an alerting signal. Now there's a slight dip in the mid afternoon between you know, one and four in the afternoon when there is a decrease in that alerting signal, which is why you kind of feel sleepy after eating lunch. Nothing to do with eating. Everything to do with the fact that it's your normal dip in your alertness. And then uh, this increases and then in darkness, Melatonin is secreted that dampens your alerting signal, right? So they're two separate things. Mm -hmm. Now we know, we know what accumulates in your brain the longer you've been awake. We know what your homeostatic drive is. We know that because the drug that, the drug, um, that, that fights the homeostatic drive that, that, that uh, adenosine that accumulates in your brain is the most, of, most used drug in the world and which is? Ca caffeine, oh. right? So, Sorry, wrong way. caffeine. So when the longer you're awake, <laughs> your brain accumulates adenosine, which is a hormone, and that the long and that accumulates and makes you sleepy. And caffeine goes and blocks the effect of adenosine on the brain. Now, here are a few things you should know about caffeine. Number one is, caffeine takes about 15 to 20 minutes to take effect. But then its half-life is about five hours. Which means that when my players, when, they're, you know, when their game begins at 7.30 in the, in the evening, and they drink a lot of caffeine uh, between six and seven in preparation, and energy drinks in preparation for that game, and you tell them to go to sleep at around midnight or 11 o'clock at night, half of that caffeine is still in their system. They're not gonna fall asleep. Right? They're really wired up because, not just because they're excited and they're in awe because they've just played a game, but also because caffeine is still in their system. So that's just something that you have to keep in mind, that caffeine stays in your system for a while. Also, different people respond to caffeine in a different way. The third thing, the third thing that happens about caffeine is that, you know, if you drink caffeine on a regular basis, you get acclimatized to it and you develop a tolerance to it, which means that you may need, one cup of coffee may keep you awake, but then, and if you do that on a regular basis, in about 10 or 12 days or two weeks, you're gonna need one and a half cups of coffee for the same effect. And people who are habitual users of caffeine, so a, a habitual user is somebody who's drinking between three or four cups of coffee on a regular basis, there's no effect on your reaction time. But, but if you stop drinking it, you're going to have withdrawals which is why people continue to drink it, because they want to prevent the withdrawals that they get from the habitual caffeine use. This is just something to keep in mind. Okay, but, but I want to spend a little time talking about that circadian clock that I was just talking about, right? Because that's important to recognize. So because we live on a rotating rock, and because there's alternating day and night, all cellular systems in our body have developed these clocks, cellular clocks, that anticipate this, the, um, the night and day, and that helps us conserve energy, okay? So in, in, the human, in human beings, that circadian clock is, is in your brain. Now pay attention, I'm gonna have a quiz on this slide after this, is, there's a lot of science on here. So, so this is, the, the circadian clock is in your brain, and it's synchronized to the, uh, to the outside by night and day. So the way it works is that eye, light enters your eye and your eye, like your ear, has two functions. You use your ears for hearing as well as for balance. You use your eyes for vision 
and you also use it for light perception for your circadian clock. So light enters your eye, goes straight to, the, to your circadian clock, and that suppresses the secretion of melatonin. And because melatonin is secreted, your, your brain secretes this alerting signal that wakes you up in, in the morning, which is why people say you should go out into the sunlight. Right? That's going to wake you up. That's because that light actually affects your brain and wakes you up further. In darkness, when, when it's dark, melatonin gets secreted and this suppresses this alerting signal. So in fact, if we know, if as a doctor I know the timing of your melatonin secretion, I know the timing of every other circadian rhythm in your body. So it's, it's, it's really, it's pretty cool. So here are a few things about your circadian system. So the first thing is that your circadian system, it's intrinsic. So if you took cells out of your, your circadian clock and put them in a petri dish, they would still keep time. It's something that's intrinsic. And they found that out 300 years ago when this astronomer found, you know, the mimosa plant that opens and closes, opens with light, closes in darkness. He accidentally left it in a dark closet and it still continued to do it. It did not need light to have that rhythm. It still continued to do it. And we, they, they, they also demonstrated it, it in human beings. So Kleitman is the grandfather of sleep medicine. In the 1930s, he took a student with him and went down to the mammoth caves and spent 33 days in dim lightness to, to study his circadian rhythm and found that, yes, you didn't need lights to have your circadian rhythm. You continue to have them. The second thing is that in addition to your brain, every cell in your body and every biological system in your body has a circadian rhythm. So when, you know, this being midnight, this is noon, this is 6 in the morning, 6 p.m. So as the day progresses, different, different biological systems peak and ebb in a 24-hour cycle. Now, this is a complicated slide. The only thing I want you to pay attention to is that things like your best coordination, your fastest reaction time, your greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength, they all peak in the late afternoon, between 4 and 7 in the evening. Which is uh, the good, is that me? So, which is a good thing, because, so, there's actually a time during the day when athletic performance when you, your athletic performance tends to peak and it's in the evening. It's the same time when your body temperature tends to peak. It's when muscle stiffness and joint stiffness is at its minimum. That's when, when your um, uh, athletic performance is at its very best. Now, why is this important? Well, so, you know, there's some data that supports this. So, they, for example, in the NFL, when you look at night games between East versus West Coast, the West Coast is playing when they're at a biological advantage, right? And they've looked at 40 years of NFL data, and they've looked at evening games, and they found that evening games, West Coast tends to win twice as often and beats the East Coast twice as often. It beats the Las Vegas point spread to win because they are playing at an advantage. There, there is no such difference during the day games. This is only in the evening because they're playing at an advantage. The second thing is that this, they show that in the NBA, so they looked at uh, East versus West Coast night games and they looked at direction of travel and found that West Coast uh, teams, again, had the winning percentage is much higher when, uh, in, in evening games. Similarly, they found that in, in Major League Baseball. So in Major League Baseball, they already found that if, if a team travels and crosses more than two or three time zones, its likelihood of winning reduces by 40%. But also, they looked at East Coast teams, which had been out at the West Coast. When they come back, they're now jet lagged to their own home time zone, right? Because now they're, they're used to the, to the West Coast. So they lost they lost home field advantage, which is about 3.9 percentage, and tend to lose the first game when they come back because they are, especially if the opposing team is coming from the East Coast. So there's actually, there is actually a biological advantage or disadvantage, depending on the time of, of the game is, and that's based on your circadian clock. 
Okay. The other thing that your circadian clock also decides is what your chronotype is. Whether you're a night owl or a morning person. Now, the, whether you're a night owl or a morning person, do you guys know whether you're night owls or morning people? How many night owls in the audience? How many morning people? Who, go, who cannot fall asleep before one o'clock in the morning? Turn around, say hi to each other. You guys are the night owls, <laughs> right? And that it, this is biologically driven. In fact, it's genetic, which is why I tell, my, I tell players, it doesn't really matter how far you move away from home, your parents still decide what time you go to bed. <laughs> because it is genetic, <laughs> right? Now, if you're a night owl and you're a morning person, well, that has implications on your performance the next day because you know how I talked about peak performance usually occurs in the late evening, early, early evening, late afternoon, between four and seven. That's, that's what happens when you look at them as a, as a whole. But, and so these are, these are competition level athletes in Europe. And what they did is they looked, this, it's called the bleep test, which is a, um, uh, a test of cardiovascular um, peak, peak uh, performance. And they looked at it at, at 7 in the morning, 10 a.m., 1 in the afternoon, 4 p.m., 7 p.m., and 10 in the evening. So as a group, yes, the peak performance occurred between 4 and 7. But when they divided them into morning, intermediate, or late night owls, morning people peaked earlier. That's their peak performance occurs earlier. Late night owls peak later in the evening. Now this is important because, you know, uh, at least when, when I work with teams, what you want is you want all the team members to peak together. And you want that, the, the time that they peak, their performance peak to coincide with actual game time, right? So for example, there are morning people or always pitch better during day games. Night owls will pitch better uh, in, in the night games. And there is a way that you can shift using light therapy and melatonin to help shift them to adjust. So you can decide, you know, so these are, this, is, this is the direction that sports is going forward. That's what we're, you know. And, and the other thing is that the, helping them in jet lag. So you, that's what, you know, that's how I started with the Lions a long time ago is when they were going to London to help them adjust. Because when, when you take a jet to go and you cross time zones and go to a new time zone, your biological rhythms lag behind. And so when you get to the new time zone, your, you know, your, your circadian rhythm is now scrambling to get in sync with the new time zone and that's what jet lag is. And you want to treat it because jet lag can affect performance. Okay. So, so, so here's the sad part of the story. The thing is that the way that we evolved on Earth, our circadian rhythms evolved because our light, uh, our, our eyes were are able to see candle, firelight, and moonlight. But that doesn't affect your circadian rhythms. So, so and, and during the day, when you're exposed to bright, bright light, it synchronizes your circadian rhythms on a daily basis. So, you know, 200 years ago, when there was no light, electricity, people would go to bed when it, was, when it was dark. And they would go to bed because, it was, because lighting a candle was really expensive. It was expensive to have, you know, to, to create extra light. The problem is that now, we live in a world where, with, with the invention of the light bulb, so the initial light bulb was incandescent and you could dim it. Now the LED lights have a very high amount of blue-green light, and blue-green light can actively suppress your melatonin. And you know, 90% of Americans have a bright artificial light, bright screens in their bedrooms. And we use it within an hour of going to bed, and that actively suppresses your melatonin and, and prevents you from falling asleep, even though it may be your bedtime. And then, then in the day when we wake up, oftentimes we don't go outside, right? What we do, we get up in the morning, um, once we are ready, we put on our sunglasses, get into our cars, go to work, and, and the, out, the work is not as well lit. So it doesn't synchronize our circadian rhythms as much. In fact, the, the morning time is the worst time to wear sunglasses. You shouldn't. You want to expose yourself to bright light because that's what helps synchronize your circadian clock. 
Well, and, and why is this important? So I, here's an example I want to uh, uh, share with you. So, yeah, for, you know, they, the September 11th, uh, um, I don't installation, have, if you've ever been to, to New York City, you know, on September 11th, they have these, two, these four mile high beams of light that shoot into the sky, right? And so when this first came about, people would gather to look at it and they found that there were millions of these really tiny white specks in these lights. And what they found is these were migratory birds. And because of the light, because my, birds have circadian rhythms, they had lost their, their way. And they were, in the, they were in the light and they were, you know, uh, bumping into each other the same way that moths do around light. And, and so, so the Audubon Society talked to, the, to them and asked them to dim the lights down. Anyway, I just wanted to emphasize the, the importance of light pollution, which is affecting not just human health, but really is affecting um, even birds. And like I said, you know, uh, ev like I said, every, every, every cell in your body, every organ has a circadian clock. And because of the 24 hour lives that we lead, things are, go out of whack, right? Things are out of sync. And that is what's resulting in increased disease. And so if you think about the three main ways that people age and die, it's either through atherosclerosis, which is either you know, through a heart attack or a, a stroke, or it's neurodegenerative, which is a dementia, dementias or neoplastic, which is cancer. And sleep deprivation and circadian dysrhythmia contributes to each and every one of these. Really, so it really is something that we should pay more attention to. And here's, a, you know, I, I, I like to put this in. This just came out uh, in spring of this year, and they were looking at uh, DNA breaks and uh, gene repair expression in shift workers, and they found that overnight shift workers had a lower baseline DNA repair expression and more DNA breaks. And if, they, if these shift workers were sleep deprived, then there was even further decrease in their DNA repair. And I, li I like this study because this is done on on-call doctors. So really, you know, depriving ourselves of sleep is, um, does really have an effect on our health. Okay, I am going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about teen sleep. Because I know there are parents and then some of the teens that you guys take care of are teenagers. So I want to just cover a few topics about why sleep is important for teenagers, how much sleep teenagers need, and how does sleep deprivation affect a teen. So, the first thing to know is that sleep plays a really vital role in the transition from childhood to adulthood. Because adolescents, their brains are developing and they're going through this maturation process, not just, not just physically, but emotionally, right? And you need sleep. Sleep is important for each and every step of that maturation process. You really need it for every step. And also, because adolescence is a time of increased responsibilities, peer pressure, and busy schedules, sleep is often compromised, right? So why is sleep important for teenagers? Number one, it's because it is food for the brain. You know, th there are periods in a child's life when a, a newborn baby in the first two years of life, your brain is really developed. A lot of your emotional development happens when you're a teenager, that's when you know, that's when the development happens. Number two is um, it, it helps us perform effectively and safely. Of course, it's essential for uh, growth and maturation uh, for development. It's also a, teenagers, if they form good sleep habits, they're going to carry that as they get older. You know, I work a little bit with USA Baseball. And if you, tr if you, if you teach teenagers to sleep well, they will make student, if you teach student athletes to sleep well, they will, they will sleep better as professional athletes. That's when you want to start with them. And, uh, and it's, it's really important for health and nutrition. Okay, Let's, we should take a picture of that. <laughs> okay, so Teens and, and sleep problems. So the, the first thing I want you to know is that number one, the number one cause of drug use in teenagers is being sleep deprived. That's why they are taking amphetamine, you know, uh, stimulants. And then the only, sometimes the only way to combat those stimulants is by taking downers. 
That's just something to keep in mind. So the main sleep problems are they don't get enough sleep, they have poor sleep habits. And remember how I talked about chronotypes about being night owls or morning people? Teenagers are biologically wired to be night owls. So if your teenager, if he is not going to sleep on time, it's because he can't. You know, he, you, they just can't fall asleep before midnight. And if they go to bed at midnight and they need nine hours of sleep, they shouldn't be waking up before nine. The problem is that school begins too early, right? And so th that's why they get sleep deprived. And you know, a lot of them have technology. They all have electronics in their uh, bedroom. And as, uh, because they're teenagers, parents, I have a teenager, we monitor them less because you want to teach them some amount of responsibility, right? So the teenage lifestyle is, uh, some of them may have part-time after uh, school jobs. They may have sports and extracurricular curricular activities. And I know in hockey, I know because my husband plays hockey and my son used to, uh, ice time was like from nine to 10 or so, you know. And, and so swimmers and hockey players get the worst sleep. And they get the worst sleep because they're limited about ac with access to facilities. You know, swimmers, for some reason, are swimming at five in the morning. So five in the morning for a teenager is like waking up at two in the morning for an adult because of the way they're wired. Because their biological bedtime is from midnight to nine in the morning. Can't wake them up at five o'clock to bring them to play. Um, of course, then they have computer, internet access, watching TV. Um, then there's social and peer pressure. And all, so all of these activities compete with a sleep, a teen sleep time. So, so we, what we know, you know, we know is that 85% of teens get less sleep. And they're, more, they're one of the most sleep deprived people in our society. Many teens, teens arrive to school like zombies because their brains are still on the pillow when school starts. And less sleep does not equal to more time. You know, just because they're getting less sleep doesn't make, because they're, they're sleeping through the first three, three periods in school. So that's just something to keep, um, keep in mind. But the most important fact is that, that drowsy driving is the number one killer of teenagers. Number one cause of death in teenagers is drowsy driving. Number two is suicide, right? And I'm, I'm, I will say that science shows that because deep sleep deprivation results in impairment in mood, I think sleep dep deprivation results in increased suicide too. So it really affects both the first two causes of, of uh, um, death in teens. Now I'll tell you what happens when you fall asleep while you're driving. So when you fall asleep while you're driving, you may actually get out of the house and feel perfectly fine. And then you sit down in your car because sleepiness has this really unique characteristic to it. If you're up and about, if you're walking around, if you're under bright light, you're not going to feel sleepy. But quiet, boring, dull situations unmask sleepiness. Here was an example, right? <laughs> quiet room, dull speaker, <laughs> fell asleep. It just unmasked his sleepiness, right? Driving is a very boring situation. It's quiet, it's dull, it's boring, it's sedentary. Now, when you fall asleep, whenever you fall asleep, the first thing that happens is that for the first few milliseconds, you go completely blind. So your eyes still may be open, but there's no visual information going to, the, to your brain. Your feet may still be on the gas pedal. You're still holding on to that, the, the steering wheel. When you fall asleep, that is why drowsy accidents are more likely to be fatal. They typically occur within five miles of wherever, you know, your home or wherever you've left. Because you, you got out of work feeling perfectly fine. You got out of, you know, dragged yourself out of bed, had a coffee, sat down in the car, and that's how you fall asleep. And the, the second most important reason is that in any sort of accident, even if it's a drunk driving, you always take corrective measures. When you fall asleep, while you're driving, you're alone in the car and you fall asleep, there's no corrective. You either, you cross the median onto oncoming traffic or you veer off the road and go into a ditch or, and if you're driving at 60 or 70 miles per hour, you can, this can ha happen in, in milliseconds because you were driving blind. 
for the first few seconds. Anyway, I, I, wherever I go to speak and whenever there are parents in the audience, I always want to bring it up. If there are coaches in the audience, I want to, especially with young adults, because you should know this. You should, be, you should know this because it is important for us to talk to our teenagers. If you are sleepy, you know, you, you never have to wait for being drowsy before pulling over and taking a nap. I mean, that applies to all of us. Okay. So, um, it, you know, uh, yes, we know that if you're, if you're sleepy, you get worse grades. Um, you're cranky, you're, you're, you're depressed. You're, less, you're more likely to be grumpy. But also, like, I've already talked a little bit about, about drowsy driving. I just want to show you, there was, there's been one school in Minnesota public schools, they've changed the morning time and they've delayed morning time that they, the teenagers come to school by just one hour and they found there was a 70% reduction in drowsy driving, in accidents. And of course, uh, you know, there's, there's a significant improvement in grades, etc. Okay, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about, I, I hope I've shown you that, that sleep and your circadian rhythms actually does affect each and every aspect of human performance, right? And, and the second thing is that there is no compromising sleep because the deficits are cumulative and they're, they're often non-recoverable. You really have to work on getting enough sleep on a regular basis. Now with professional athletes, when I look at their schedule, I will, um, I will actually, in, in, in the form of a grid, show them exactly where, what their bedtime should be, what time they should be taking a nap, how, you know, how to prepare for when you know you're going to be sleep deprived. So for example, if I know that I'm going to get less sleep because I'm on call in a week's time, the worst thing I can do to myself is get less sleep now because then my, my pot is going to be empty when I go into that sleep deprivation. So bank sleep when you can. Get enough sleep when you can. I know there'll be situations when you get less sleep and then play catch up once you're done with that situation. Take naps, naps are good for you. And then the, finally, you know, in an individual where we are looking to best our individual and team performance, circadian advantage, this is something that I, um, a lot of work that I do um, with, with players and teams. Um, and I think I'll, I'll end right here before somebody else falls asleep. <laughs> Yes. When you talk about um, naps are good, and isn't it, isn't it the quality of sleep? Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily. I mean, time helps us remember like mm -hmm. eight to ten hours of sleep, or nine to eleven, or what have you. But I mean, can you set your chronotype? Number one and two. When you're talking about taking naps, isn't it the quality of sleep that you get? Like how far you go into a deep sleep in order to right. Take so, so when it comes to naps, there are three things to keep in mind. The first is the, the length of the nap, right? So a power nap is about a 20 to 25 minute nap. A 20 to 25 minute nap will take that edge, will satisfy some of that, that adenosine that's been accumulating and will give you enough, enough energy for the next few hours. And it's funny, do you know how the word power nap came about? It was because in the 70s, um, you know, astronauts, because they're in space, they were getting really bad sleep and they were very tired. Now, if you're an astronaut in, in space and you do something wrong, you die. So, so they wrote to sleep specialists at the Harvard uh, Medical School and said, what should we do? And he said, well, you, they have to take naps because of their schedule. He's like, well, I can't tell my astronauts to take a nap. He's like, well, can, if, can you call it a power nap? Like, call it something that's manly? And that's how the word power nap came about. So, so that's the first length, the 20 to 25 minutes, right? When you wake up from a 20 minute nap, you wake up from light sleep. That's still refreshing. A 30 minute nap is you have some amount of stage two, which is slightly deeper sleep. That's again a good nap. Then is a 90 minute nap is a full sleep cycle. That's like a granddaddy nap. That's, that's what, what uh, you know, two granddaddy naps is what NHL players do before their games in the mid-afternoon. You know, that's how, because it gives them an, enough energy before you, um, you know, before the game. The one nap you don't want to do is you don't want to take a nap which is between 45 to an hour long because that nap, you wake up from deep sleep and you're going to feel groggy for a while. You know how you wake up and for, it's like, it's like how a car takes more energy to, to get going. Um, but once it gets going, it's fine. So. This, so the second thing is the timing of the nap is important. So 
that mid-afternoon dip in the alertness that I showed you, that's a good time to take a nap. In the mid-afternoon, uh, when you're already sleepy or tired, you know, that's a good time to take a nap. Um, if you're going to be playing, so if the game, if the kickoff or, the, you know, the hockey time is at 7 p.m., don't take a nap within an hour of that because you don't want that sleep inertia to interfere with it. So, so that was your first question. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of questions in there. The chronotype, can you retrain your brain? Right. So, yes, you can, but it takes a lot of discipline. So if you have, so um, it's, um, it's, it's really simple. If you expose yourself to bright light in the morning, it will help you go to bed earlier. If you expose yourself to bright light at night, it will make, make you more of a night owl. Right? So light, timing of light and, um, and use of melatonin, strategic use of melatonin is how you can shift your chronotype. You know, you want to do this under the guidance of somebody who knows what they're doing. So, and, and, and you know, some would call me an expert because I do this on a regular basis, but one of the things that I do right now, and I do for, you know, your local NHL team and all the, many of the NHL teams is that now that their schedules have come out, so the coaches will send me their schedule and tell me to look at, um, uh, especially when they're going to the East or West Coast to see, you know, to make some recommendations. And I've been doing this for years, but I still have to, you know, take out a piece of paper and pencil and draw out and I, you, there are a few apps you can use in which you can, you know, coincide uh, timings with each other to map out where your circadian clocks will be. So you really, timing is really everything when it comes to light exposure. Yes. So what is your feeling towards taking melatonin out of your sleep? So uh, melatonin, a uh, couple of things. Number one is that melatonin is not a sleeping pill. It's a chrono. It, it's it's not a sleeping pill. What it does is it signals your brain that you're ready to sleep. So it, let me try to make this. So it, it, it emphasizes nighttime physiology. And you know it's not a sleeping pill because in nocturnal animals, release of melatonin causes increased activity. So there are a few things that you should know. It's number one, because it's not regulated by the FDA, because it's, it's not regulated. You don't know what you're getting right. uh, when you say you're getting melatonin. So the recommended dose is, is between 0.5 to 3 or 5 milligrams. And, uh, you know, I think a couple of years ago they did studies and they looked at a bunch of um, melatonin supplements and they found that, that some of them contained 400 times the amount and some of them did not contain melatonin at all. So that's just one thing to be careful about. The timing of melatonin is really important. And you, again, um, you want to talk, uh, you know, before you put a teenager on melatonin, you want them to see a physician because mel in lower animals, melatonin um, decides mating behavior. So we don't know how it affects teenagers as yet because we're not allowed to do those studies. So that's just something to keep in mind. Yes? Do phone apps really gauge the quality of No, 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 no. They're complete nonsense. Okay, so uh, do phone apps gauge the quality of your sleep? So the, there are some wearables that um, you can wear around your wrists. And if, they, if you wear them around your wrist, they measure movement. And from the movement, they infer whether you're asleep or not. So if, you're going to, if you tell it you're sleeping and you keep watching TV without moving that hand, it's going to think you're asleep. So it can approximate time depending on how, you know, how accurate they are. Uh, but if they're, t if they're telling you they know what stage of sleep you, you're in, that's complete nonsense. And, um, uh, you know, I, I have to say, though, technology is moving at a very fast speed. So in a few years, there may be an app that, you know, which, which, which somehow transmits and picks up your brain waves and is able to tell you how much you're sleeping. We're just not there as yet. Yes. Sorry. I'm curious as to any input you might have on gaming and sleep. So gaming, game, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I actually um, consult with a few um, professional gamers. Um, so uh, you're not talking about professional gamers, right? You're just talking about the interaction. So uh, with, with yeah. So uh, the two things. The the first thing is that again the light 
will suppress your melatonin so when you take it in the evening. The second thing is that they really are extremely, they're interactive, right? So from the sleep point of view, there is, uh, you know, nobody ever looked at a gaming and said, nobody ever went on to any sort of game, any sort of video game, any sort of social media and said, I didn't spend enough time there. You always walk away thinking, ah, oh, you know, I wanted to do this for 15, 20 minutes and you tend to spend more time that you, than you ever intended. The third thing is that, you know, the th uh, professional um, people who make these game, video games, you know, they, they hire behavioral psychologists who, ha who ha use the same principles that they use in casinos to get you to use them more and more. So gaming, I like to tell people, uh, video gaming is not relaxation, it's a distraction. Right, so it will, and, and if you do it in the evening, it will prevent you from falling asleep. Anybody else? Yes? I just can't help but look at all the information and think about folks who were third shift and how yep. these are problems. Yeah. Every single thing is a problem. Right, right. Well, so the largest, so shift work is associated with increased risk of cancer. So in many European countries, you can sue your uh, employer if you're a shift worker and, um, uh, and you develop cancer. So, so most of the shift work, uh, sleep, sleep effects of shift work have been done in nurses because nurses are the largest uh, um, population of shift workers and they have you know, increased uh, risk of, of cancer, decreased fertility, and uh, you know, increased uh, metabolic, cardiometabolic metabolic side effects, yes. They're very, very, there is, an, there is a shift works uh, society that um, is trying to get changes made so that, so that there's more self-selection. So for example, you know, night owls would be better off as night workers. So um, the problem is that shift workers, it, you can eventually adjust to a new shift if you lived like that all the time. The problem is that shift workers sleep differently when they're on their days off because they want to be part of, you know, social network and their family. And so, so they really compromise their sleep. <laughs>